Welcome, my name is Jan Levy, and I'm really delighted to be joined by Associate Professor Daniel Munich uh, from Search EI and from the National Council of Economic Advisors in the Czech Republic. Um, you previously served uh, in, uh, as an advisor to many ministers in the Czech Republic, ministers of finance, ministers of uh, education, so we're really mm -hmm. looking forward to your views. Let's, let's talk about the labor market, because okay. that's, that's an area of your mm -hmm. research, and especially unemployment. Mm -hmm. Students often ask whether there has to be any unemployment at all. Why, why do we have unemployment? <laughs> why are some people unemployed? So you are speaking about the market economy, right? You are not That's speaking right. about North Korea. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, market economy is characterized by changes. Everything is changing. Uh, industries are growing, declining. Professions are growing, declining. Uh, firms are established and closed. And uh, there are people and they live their lives for... 50 years, I mean active life, and they have to face these changes. And there are many firms, uh, many professions and so on. And uh, the individual still is the same. He, gets a, he is educated in some field, he has some experience, and he has to face these changes. So when the firm is uh, closed down or occupation job is closed down, he has to find out another alternative. And there are many alternatives. Uh, and uh, the person maybe doesn't know precisely where are the alternatives or which is the better one. So naturally, the person takes some time to pick up uh, the better alternative and it takes time and for this duration of time, this period we call unemployment. Of course, there are many people who have uh, few opportunities to work. Uh, because their best opportunity, the, the best option is to stay unemployed, collect some, some benefits and have spare time to work on their garden, take care of their children or sit in the bar, <laughs> okay? So Would all these kind of people be uh, classified as unemployed? Because one of the definitions uh, <laughs> of unemployment is that you, you don't have a job but you're actively looking for one. Yeah. So, and they, they don't seem like they're looking uh, if they want to work on their garden. Yes, there is interesting distinction between what economists, academic economists, see as unemployment and um, administrators. So we have official administrative definition of unemployment, which requires that person is actively looking for a job uh, and that, that uh, the person is ready for a job and job is uh, requirement. While many economists do not care much about this, and they distinguish people working and non-working, <laughs> okay? uh, but it's just minor note. So. All these people face some period of unemployment, uh, they search or do not, and uh, this is uh, what I want to say is that unemployment is a natural component of market economy, is a natural product of changes. Okay. But uh, the key issue we should probably debate is how long is the unemployment, to what extent it is because pe people are picky, that they are waiting for better offer, and to what extent there is really no offer for these people than to sit at home in bar and so on. A uh, famous economist uh, Schumpeter uh, summarized this uh, by calling the, the market economy process as creative destruction. Mm -hmm. We have all these inventions and they basically mm -hmm. uh, implicitly dis destruct some of, the, some of the old things. So we, what you mentioned uh, to me, it seemed like uh, there's, there's this frictional unemployment where people are changing between jobs yeah. and there's also the structural one where, where the, there's a mismatch between the skills that people have uh, some industries closing down. We had the crisis now. So many of the finance people lost their jobs. Now mm -hmm. we have to, you know, retrain and so on. Mm -hmm. Is this structural uh, unemployment big now in the in the aftermath of the global financial crisis? Is it really uh, an explanation for the high unemployment that we see in in Europe and in the United States? Uh, um? Interestingly, there is a great variation across countries, and uh, we cannot compare Europe and US because Europe is a very heterogeneous uh, area and uh, you, you can find different patterns in the structure of unemployment comparing Czech Republic, UK, France, Spain, uh, Italy, so on. So I cannot make some general statement. Definitely unemployment uh, uh, grew everywhere during the crisis uh, in all European countries, but to different extent. It affected different people, and what is most important is that uh, in some countries it was just this frictional unemployment. So some uh, industries were going down forever, 
and new industries are emerging because the comparative advantages have changed. So it's some kind of a healthy uh, process where people stop working in one uh, in fab, uh, company, then have some more time of unemployment, and then they start working elsewhere, maybe getting some retraining and so on. It's healthy. People don't like it much. People don't, want, don't like changes usually, but finally it's healthy because the new industry will be much more productive than the old one. But we have countries where uh, governments are trying to prevent unemployment. They subsidize industries, they help uh, jobs, they force employers to keep keep labor. The, the US auto, automobile industry? Uh, it might be might be an example. So, some, some farming uh, in, in Europe? Yeah, so for, from the sh- uh, short-term period, it seems good because it keeps people employed, people feel happy. The problem is postponed to the future, but the future will arrive one day so finally these people will become unemployed, but the new industry will not be established yet. And maybe these people will stay uh, long term long term unemployed and the country overall will be poor or poorer than it could be. Let's look, I mean you talked about the heterogeneity across countries, but mm-hmm. let's look at Europe. You have a, a two thousand and seven paper with uh, Jan Schweiner, a very famous Czech economist, uh, about uh, long term unemployment in in Europe. So can you talk about Europe a little bit and outline why Europe tends to have a high unemployment? In fact, now in some countries like Spain, Greece, unemployment is is more than 25%. And probably even more importantly, it's about 55-60% in the youth group, in youth, yeah. uh, which, which, is, which is terrible. So what are the, the main reasons for high unemployment in Europe? Again, I cannot say reasons applying to all these countries. What matters, what we know already, is that institutional system matters. This is the flexibility of uh, layoffs and uh, hiring. Uh, this is uh, the, mm, these are the labor costs, the taxation of labor. Uh, it's this subsidization of uh, declining industries and uh, missing support, uh, uh, expanding industries, for example, by promoting better infrastructure and so on. So uh, educational systems differ a lot uh, because education is the uh, agenda of national member states. Uh, European Union has nothing to say almost. And we have very different educational systems. Uh, Czech Republic has uh, very long studies. So one explanation why Czechs uh, have so few young people unemployed is because they spend so much time in the educational system compared to UK, for, in- for example. So what I want to say is that you can not generalize. Another example related to uh, the, the pension schemes. The Czech pension scheme has this uh, statutory retirement age. It's something like a signal, red light for employers and employees that uh, soon you will become useless, you will become uh, retiree, and uh, we will not invest into you, you will not invest into yourself, you will be simply discarded. In other countries, in the UK or US, you mentioned, if you look, statutory retirement age is something not existing. You know, you see people retiring in different, very different ages. In Czech Republic, it looks like you wake up one day and you become a retiree. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to label just one explanation. And the studies we are uh, doing are collecting data on institutional factors, putting these together, trying to explain to what extent they contribute to um, the differences in unemployment rate. You mentioned the flexibility of the labor market. And mm-hmm. Yeah, obviously that this is related to the to the issue of job security. Most people would say, you know, it's it's great to have these uh, kind of checks and balances so that the, the nasty employer can't fire people at will. But what most people don't realize that these kind of uh, rigidities and inflexibilities uh, increase unemployment because uh, the the firms are, are are not willing to hire people they, that they know that they they won't be able to fire them at will. So, do you think that this job security issue is is kind of somehow more important in Europe, and that might explain some of the higher unemployment across uh, many European countries? Uh, Definitely, this is a very important factor, and uh, the problem is that it you cannot see it directly, explicitly. You don't know that the firm is not hiring because you imposed uh, some restrictions on firing people. But you find out if you explore it in detail, if you talk to 
personal human resource managers at firms who will tell you that uh, hiring new school graduate with just diploma without any other information experience on it and not um, having the power to lay him off after s two months, it's very binding and you will finally decide not to hire him or to hire him on some very, very strange contract which, also, which is uh, bad because it doesn't provide uh, social security and other things. So this is, I think, a growing uh, problem in Europe. And that's why there is this debate about flex security, the concept uh, the, uh, the, in Denmark. This is an idea that uh, let's uh, private sector do what it, it is doing well, and let's governments do what they can do well. So let's uh, government do the sh uh, social issues, let them take care of unemployed, let the uh, government retrain them, f helping finding them jobs, but do not ask firms to provide welfare mm -hmm. to these people because governments can do it better. Okay? And now, uh, in, in this case, I am reminding uh, my Czech students who, or students from post-communist countries, the system here during communist uh, central planning. In those times, there are few really poor people because there was full employment in those times. But full employment meant that the firm, the state-owned firm, was primarily responsible for paying these low productive people who were not useful f maybe for the firm, but uh, firms got money from the state, so they paid these people. Policemen uh, forced people to work everywhere, so we didn't need social system so because the welfare system provided through by by state-owned companies. Mm -hmm. But we are in market economy and democracies, and I think flex security is good uh, good um, idea for Czech Republic and many other European countries. Uh, so let's let's look at the minimum wages. So in this mm -hmm. heated debate about the effects of minimum wages, whether they're a good idea, what they uh, what they uh, cause in terms of uh, unemployment. Can mm -hmm. you just briefly outline? Uh, you know, is it a good idea to have a, a legislated minimum wage, and what, what effects it can have on unemployment? Again, it depends. It depends uh, under which settings, uh, how low or how high, high it is in Czech Republic. It's so low that it doesn't. It affects really few few people, uh, but in other countries it's uh, high, so that any minor increase may affect many people. So any debate like this should uh, be accompanied by questions uh, whether you care about wages and also the zero wages for those who will lose jobs because uh, employers will not be willing to pay th their wages. Uh, what other effects are in uh, place, for instance... So uh, that would imply that, that they tend to increase unemployment because employers won't yeah, be willing to yeah, pay yeah, their yeah, wages? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you ask employers uh, to hire someone at higher wage, be, uh, which is higher than personal productivity, then employer will naturally lay off the person and the person will have zero wage, right? But uh, frequently in these debates, nobody cares about these zero wages. They, uh, they care about the... Observed wages. Another question is to what extent will employers replace uh, the low skilled uh, workers by machines, which will be finally cheaper than minimum wage paid to self employed? Well, you see the trend in some, some of the fast food restaurants, McDonald's, and so on, that tend to uh, uh, bring in more automation and, and so on. Maybe but maybe it's productive finally because uh, McDonald's will produce everything by uh, robots and uh, people which are in effect more valuable uh, entities than robots will do other things elsewhere, so we will finally be, uh, we will be richer, right? I am not against this kind of progress, but it shouldn't be uh, motivated by increasing uh, minimum wages. But uh, it should be uh, taken into account that the minimum wages affect primarily some particular groups. I already mentioned uh, school graduates, and I don't mean uh, university graduates, I mean those people with very low education, handicapped, disadvantaged, disadvantaged people who... Migrants. Uh, and, and migrants and so on, whose other option frequently is uh, shadow or even black economy or criminal activities. It should be also included into the debate. I, as academician, I know how 
difficult it is to identify those impacts of minimum wages increase. You mentioned the McDonald's uh, in the US. There are studies focusing on, on these, but uh, you know what works in one country cannot be generalized to other countries. So um, there are still hot debates about what these effects are. Should we increase minimum wage or decrease? There's a uh, proposal that kind of builds on the idea of minimum wages, and that's, that's the basic income. There are groups in Europe who argue that um, people have right, a right for a basic income, so no matter what the person does, he would get a certain income. For example, in, in Switzerland now, there was a petition that had 120,000 uh, signatures, and, uh, and uh, the amount that they talk about is 2,500 uh, Swiss francs a month, which is... Uh, you know, 2,700 2, US dollars, uh, a pretty high amount, that would be paid to anyone regardless of whether they, do, they, uh, they work or not work. Uh, and, and obviously that would scrap the, the social system, so that would replace some of the social system. But what, what's your view on this? Uh, is that a good idea? Well, I don't know whether these, the proponents of this ever uh, inserted these numbers into Excel sheet, counting w what amount of money would be needed to realize this. It's a huge amount of money. If you look at the GDP and the current state budgets, and it's many times more than you have available after you pay for, um, for education, for police, for army and for pensions. Maybe these people think that uh, we should uh, eliminate police, education, uh, uh, health and other things because everything will be private and uh, people will buy it from this money. But uh, I suggest that they compute this amount. It's a huge amount of money. Uh, if you set the parameter, uh, as you said, uh, I don't know how many fr thousand yeah, francs, right? So it's very, very stupid idea. And in addition, you pay a great deal of people who do not need this money at all, mm -hmm. rich people. So I think that without mean testing in, in uh, benefit uh, schemes, uh, we cannot And the, exist. the other idea is that you need to think about the incentives, right? What, I mean, now there are people who, who uh, might be working for 2,000 Swiss francs. Now, if they get 2,500, I mean, they're no, no, no longer going to be willing to work. So, so if you look at the current tax revenues that you're getting, mm -hmm. if you introduce the system there, you know, this is obviously going to reduce. So this the amount of money that you have is going even, to be even less than... Yeah. than in, uh, in the medium term, you will get even sure. less state uh, budget money than before. Yeah, the idea of uh, incentive it comes from another angle, and it's that if this money do not shrink with your higher earnings, it will not discourage you from work. So it may be uh, work from for some margin of people, but definitely this effect you mentioned is much stronger. And another effect might be on people's incentives to actually get education, right? Because there'll be less of an incentive to, to get education. So can you, I mean, you put some studies looking at the relationship between education and, and mm -hmm. human capital accumulation and, and, and prosperity, unemployment. Uh, can you highlight uh, what the effects are? Are more educated people less likely to be unemployed or more likely? What's mm -hmm. the... Well, uh, the correlation between education and unemployment uh, is uh, negative almost everywhere. <laughs> you know, it's nice. Uh, uh, the question is whether it's education itself or smarter people have are more educated and uh, that therefore are less likely to be unemployed. Uh, this pattern is quite strong in mo in all countries, including my Czech, my Czech Republic. Uh, education is quite important determinant, but education starts even before primary school. It starts in preschool, it starts in family, uh, where these cognitive and non-cognitive skills are built. So we shouldn't focus just on secondary and tertiary education. Everything starts in very early ages. That's uh, uh, almost the period of time when half of the future success or um, or disaster, <laughs> personal disaster, is being decided. So you mentioned that we, we're not sure whether there's a causal link between more education and less unemployment. We just know there's a correlation. Well, but, uh, uh, I, I bet that there is causal correlation despite that uh, I wouldn't be 
able to convince my colleagues by my uh, economic regressions that uh, I do it right. But is this an argument for the government subsidizing, say, tertiary education? I mean, should should uh, should universities be free for students? So should they not pay any fees? So what what's the idea if, if we take the implication of that? I think that both government, state budget, and individuals should contribute to tertiary education. It's a logic stemming from the fact that there are high private uh, returns to education, contrary to preschools or primary school, where the highest are social returns uh, to education, where the government should have much bigger role and even imposes mandatory education uh, on everybody. Mm -hmm. So at the tertiary level, def definitely there should be some co-financing private and public. There are estimates uh, by Andrew Lee and others that uh, an additional year of university education in Australia increases uh, earnings by about 15%. 15. Is, is that consistent across countries? So would that apply to other countries? Well, this is quite high return. Uh, common returns. Uh, you mean a return for year or for, for, for the whole studies? Whatever data you have. Uh, okay. Uh, the annual return in Europe, but average is about seven seven percent. So if you study for three years, you get to 20, 25, 30. If you study five years, you have 35, 40, 50. Uh, the highest returns are in uh, developing countries like uh, Brazil. It's linked to the interaction of demand and supply, because in Brazil there is shortage of highly educated people, that they far, therefore those few who have high education have quite high earnings. In Sweden, in Norwegian, in um, uh, North uh, European countries, Scandinavian countries, there are very low returns, much lower than those seven per year, at two or three percent, uh, because they have uh, first many university educated people, and second, they have a rather egalitarian system system of pay. Uh, so the Czech Republic, for instance, my country is somewhere in the middle. Uh, so, so given that you believe that there should be some contribution uh, from the students mm -hmm. into the tertiary education, can you highlight the, the way this should be financed? Because the, the common concern is that the students from low social economic uh, mm -hmm. background won't be able to, uh, to afford mm -hmm. financing. So tuition fees at universities have to be accompanied by a uh, system of loan, student loans with specific characteristics. It means that uh, it provides loans under the same conditions for all students, irrespective of their social background, economic conditions uh, and ability. Uh, second, uh, that uh, th th these uh, loans have to be risk-less that the pay, uh, there has to be zero risk of personal bankruptcy if the education is not successful or if uh, a graduate isn't able to repay back and that the system has to charge some interest so that people are mm, motivated to pay back uh, and at the same time uh, the loans have to be there have to be ceilings on loans because otherwise people, some people might collect such a big uh, debt that they would never be able to uh, pay back. And, and schemes with these characteristics have been implemented in a number yeah, of, of countries. Mm -hmm. Australia was, mm -hmm. was the uh, initiator yes. uh, based on Bruce mm -hmm. Chapman's uh, kind of suggestions. Mm -hmm. so, so how does it work? Can you just very briefly outline how it works uh, in Australia? Is, is there a threshold after which, income threshold after which you start Repaying, yeah. Well, in fact, you have to start uh, as a student. Uh, students are, in fact, not paying anything. They, uh, whatever they have to pay, they ask the government to pay for them, the school, and they collect the debt. And when they start earning, and when they start earning enough, they start paying back some proportion of what they earn above some threshold. So that means that if they are not earning enough, they are sick or whatever, maternity, they do not pay anything. Uh, and uh, if they do not pay back after, I think, 25 years, uh, their debt is closed and the taxpayers pay for this risk, so it's riskless. And, and the government uh, automatically collects... Uh, and that's a specific feature that uh, within the 
tax collection system, government collects also these repayments. It's cheap because it's just one additional minor item. In this, in this collection, government has all the information about earnings, contrary to banks and the financial institutions. So it's cheap. And government is relatively efficient in collecting taxes, including these repayments. But these, I mean, if we take this idea, we could apply it across the board. I mean, in this instance, the government effectively plays the role of a risk manager, like an insurance company uh -huh. that insures people and does it in, in you know, large quantities. Mm -hmm. So why don't we use it in other areas where the government currently just gives, you know, uh, grants that are non-repayable. Mm -hmm. Why don't we, if we have artists, for example, uh, and we want to subsidize uh, movies, well, rather than giving some uh, fixed amount to the movies, let's give them a loan. And if the movie is successful and reaches a certain yep. uh, profit, then then the government co collects the money back mm -hmm. uh, rather than just... Uh, and obviously, if the movie is not successful, we don't have to do mm -hmm. that. We yep. can, what's the idea of that? Well, these schemes exist, but not in large scale. Uh, for instance, in um, uh, in R and D, uh, it's frequently done that you have many projects which are not successful, but then you have just one which is tremendously successful and is able to pay back all these costs of these unsuccessful projects. It exists, but you have to do it smartly because there might be some cheating, uh, improper selection uh, of uh, those you 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 fund. There is good example uh, from something we know quite well: the pension system. Pension system is some kind of insurance system, right? You are f forced to pay something, and you, but you, at the end, you get your pension. And we unless, unless the government... Uh, yeah, 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 meantime, yeah. But we have this uh, pension system in Europe for more than 100 years in many countries, okay? People find it something very standard. They understand it. They find uh, that every developed country has to have such a pension scheme. And uh, student loans is very similar to this, but it's not at the end of the life, it's at the beginning of life. And the difference is that the money flow in another direction. First, you get the money, and then you, at the end, you pay back the money, mm, right. okay? But it helps overcoming this problem that when you need the money, you don't have them. You have them 30 years um, in the future when you will be successful graduate, not when you are young, okay? So I think it will take some time for developed countries to find out that such a system, loan system, is something very natural, like pension scheme, and that there will be in every country and nobody will question them. What, what are some other areas? I mean, now uh, there are subsidies to exporting firm, for example, and again, these are non-returnable, so... Can you think of some other areas? Definitely. People, uh, uh, you know, when can the government play the role of a risk manager rather than just some, like a donor or some, uh, some but you, rich uncle? But we already mentioned several, idea, uh, several areas where it can be used, developmental help uh, after hurricanes and these things can be used too. And uh, the person you, men so you mentioned... you mean the, the people, the victims of the natural disasters, they get a, a loan and, you know, if they do well, they have to repay. If they don't do well, they never repay. Of course, there should be some um, basic uh, help, unconditional, without any repayment. But uh, at some stage, you can think about the additional ad uh, development projects and then this is the place where you could use it. But you mentioned Bruce Johnson, who wrote a book on this, and he is uh, first uh, uh, showing uh, the areas where it works and pointing to other areas where it could be used if governments smartly uh, think about uh, how to spend money. Okay, let me just ask you one last question about a paper that you wrote, a very interesting mm -hmm. one that was published in the prestigious American Economic Review with Stepan Goraida uh, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was looking at the differences between males and females and, and the performance uh, under uh, competitive pressure. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that? And, and again, because this whole interview was about the labor market mm -hmm. and education, so how we can maybe learn from that. Uh, what okay. The key word is the competitive pressure. And the kind of pressure we have in mind is the pressure when you pass a test, high-stake test, which decides whether you graduate or not, whether you will get admitted to university, whether you get a job or not. Uh, and I'm sure you, you experienced several times in your life such important moments, but you passed some important tests which decided about your future career. And uh, 
This happens in every country and in Czech Republic uh, it happens when you want to get to university. Highly demanded, there are highly demanded universities, high stake uh, exams, and uh, if you get there, you know, you will be very likely successful in your future life because you will get education, good connections, uh, diploma, well known, and so on. If you are fail, you will not get degree and so on. So uh, we explored results of these exams and we compared these results for the same people uh, from exams which were attached to zero uh, zero stress because they didn't have any, any implications. And we compared how boys and girls performed in those two uh, tests and we found that girls who are otherwise have the same results as boys in um, uh, exams which have no implications had uh, poor results in high stake exams. So the policy implication of this finding is that uh, these high stake admission exams where there is a lot of stress are not providing good information, good enough information about ability of students admitted, then maybe there are many good girls who are rejected simply because they were too nervous to pass good tests. What I claim is that many of these tests are time limited. And many smart people are used to think about things before they uh, put answer on paper. And these are uh, disadvantage because uh, usually these tests require that you quickly answer, you memorize everything. So the implication may be that uh, these tests which have time limit are selecting people who are not appropriate, the best candidates for studies. And this is, by the way, I s think I would study more and make some research on it. And, and especially the disadvantaged uh, girls. Uh, In, one I don't, I'm not sure whether this time limit is uh, this uh, disadvantage for women. It could be, based on what we have explored until now and few other studies in other countries. Well, I think uh, that's all we have time for, but I'd like to thank you very much for, for coming and sharing your insights about unemployment in the labor market mm -hmm. with us. I'd like to thank the audience for watching, and uh, I hope to see you again in some of our next interviews. Good luck with you. Thank you very much for invitation. I was, I was happy to be here. Thank you.